afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Virology. Today we're going to talk about transcription and RNA processing. And transcription has a very specific meaning in my world, not in everyone's. It's that red arrow there in our Baltimore scheme where we have double-stranded DNA going to mRNA. That's transcription. Nothing else on this slide is transcription. And so this, if you can remember that, it's important because only double-stranded DNA can be transcribed. The gapped DNA there, the group seven, the single-stranded DNA group two, they cannot be transcribed. So today uh, we're gonna be talking about the viruses in red. You can barely see the red here, but uh, they include hepatitis B virus, parvovirus, adenovirus, herpes simplex, papilloma, and polyomaviruses. Those are the viruses with some kind of DNA uh, in the particle. And they have double-stranded DNA in their reproduction cycles, and they undergo what we call transcription. Now, the key here, the key fact for you to remember is in cells that are infected with DNA viruses, at least one protein, sometimes many, are needed to get DNA replication. Remember, the DNA viruses have to re replicate their genome. Last time we talked about how that happens for RNA viruses. Today, DNA viruses. You have to make at least one viral protein to get viral DNA replication going. Therefore, you have to transcribe first before you can do DNA replication. However, the problem is that not all DNAs as they enter the cell are ready for transcription, as I hinted on the previous slide. They have to be double-stranded DNA. Now here on this slide is, a, uh, is, is an example of a virus whose genome is ready for transcription. This is a polyomavirus SV40. We've seen the structure of this briefly. But the virus there on the, on the left-hand part of the slide, it's a reasonably small double-stranded DNA virus. It's unusual because the DNA in the particle is wrapped around uh, histones. It's chromatinized. And so uh, when it gets into the cell, it's ready to be transcribed. So here we have it, the virus getting into the cell. It goes, the DNA goes in the nucleus, and there you can see it's wrapped around uh, nucleosomes, uh, and it's ready for transcription because it's double-stranded. It's a, it's a double-stranded circular DNA, and it undergoes a cycle that we're going to talk about today. All right, so that DNA is ready for transcription. So any DNA that is double-stranded, completely double-stranded, is ready to go. It doesn't have to be chromatinized, actually, in the particle. Any DNA that goes in the nucleus is going to get chromatinized because that's a way of silencing any DNA that comes in. The cell doesn't want foreign DNA coming into it, right? Who knows what it is? So it chromatinizes it, it wraps it around histones, and that silences it, as you'll see in a bit. Now, some viral DNA genomes that we'll talk about today have to be converted to double-stranded DNAs that can be transcribed. And they include the, the three here. Only two of them we talk about today. The first one, hep hepatitis B viruses or hepatinoviruses. They have this unusual genome, which is partially double-stranded. So it's part double and part single-stranded. It's a circle. It has uh, a piece of RNA on it. You can see in the green, there's even a protein attached to one end of the DNA. It's just a mess. It's just a mess. Well, from our viewpoint, but from its viewpoint, it's beautiful, right? And it has to be repaired. That cannot be transcribed until it's repaired. So it gets in the nucleus and the cell does it a favor. It repairs it. So the cell, any DNA that's in the nucleus, which is damaged in some way, partially double-stranded, RNA on it, a protein on it, the cell fixes it. So this is called DNA repair and the DNA is then completely double-stranded. It's not DNA synthesis, it's DNA repair. And then parvoviruses are single-stranded uh, DNA viruses, which uh, have mostly single-stranded genome. The, the ends have these interesting T structures, which we'll talk about next time. Uh, but that's single-stranded, so it cannot be transcribed. The cell does it a favor. It makes it double-stranded. This is DNA synthesis now, but it's not replication. 
because all you've done is fill in that gap essentially there. You haven't made more molecules yet. You have to make a protein first in order to get the genome replicated. So remember that you always have to make at least one viral protein, maybe more to get DNA replication. So those two need conversion to templates for transcription. So on the bottom is, is the retrovirus genome where we start with an RNA, it's reverse transcribed to double-stranded DNA, which then integrates into the genome of the cell, and then it's ready for transcription. We're not gonna talk about that today, but the principles are the same. It will be transcribed uh, in its integrated place in the genome. We'll talk about that in a separate lecture. All right, so today we're gonna to talk about uh, these DNA viruses. Again, single-stranded DNA viruses, parvoviruses, are an example of those adeno-associated viruses. We will talk about those later because they're widely used as vectors for gene therapy. So they're single-stranded DNA. And then we're gonna talk about hepatitis B viruses. Uh, I just told you how, how the genome needs to be repaired. And then uh, for the double-stranded DNA viruses, we're gonna talk about uh, adenoviruses, herpes simplex, and polyoma and papilloma virus. The polyoma, the SV40 that would we just talked about. And the papillomaviruses include viruses that cause warts and anogenital cancers. We, we will come back to those later. Today, we're gonna to talk about them in molecular terms. Now, in the cell, the, there are a number of enzymes that make RNA from DNA. These are called DNA-dependent RNA polymerases. And all of these, there's Paul one, two, and three, all of them don't need a primer, <clears throat> so they make they initiate RNA synthesis de novo, right? No primer, de novo synthesis. Paul one makes ribosomal RNA, and we don't know any viral RNAs that are made from Paul one. There might be some, but we don't know about them. Paul two makes precursors to messenger RNA, micro RNAs, small nuclear RNAs, long non-coding RNAs, and many viral RNAs are made uh, by Paul two, uh, including most of the mRNAs that we're gonna talk about today. And then Paul three makes tRNAs and some ribosomal and small nuclear RNAs. And there's some viral RNAs made by that enzyme, all right? So most of the viruses that we're gonna, all the viruses we're gonna talk about today, uh, their genomes are transcribed using cellular Paul two. Only DNA viruses that reproduce in the cytoplasm encode their own DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. That's because if they're gonna be in the cytoplasm, the cell's DNA-dependent RNA polymerase isn't there, right? It's in the nucleus. So they have to encode it in their own genome. And pox viruses and giant viruses do that. They reproduce outside the nucleus. So the viruses we talked about today are going in the nucleus. So they have access to Paul II, but those cytosolic viruses do not, but we're not gonna really talk about those anymore today. That it, it makes sense that if you're gonna be in the cytosol, you need to have your own Paul II, right? Uh, all right, this is the process of transcription. We start with double-stranded DNA, in this case, we're in the nucleus, that's what we're gonna talk about today. And this red arrow always means the initiation site for mRNA synthesis. And then we make an mRNA and it's gonna be capped I'm gonna talk about a cap in a moment. We mentioned caps last time, that structure at the five prime end of mRNAs. Uh, so you make, by transcription, a pre-mRNA, a precursor, which in some cases can have introns, sequences that need to be removed by splicing. Uh, and those are removed by splicing. We add a poly A to the three prime end. And then only when the mRNA has been spliced and polydenylated can it get out of the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm where it can be translated and eventually de be degraded. Remember, not all mRNAs last forever. They have half-lives, which vary from minutes to hours to days. Some viral RNAs do get exported without being spliced, and that's unusual because in the cell, splicing, as we'll see, marks an mRNA for export out of the nucleus. And so viral mRNAs have to get around that because in many cases, they don't get spliced. So we'll see how that happens. All right, so in the cytosol, the mature mRNA capped polyadenylated splice is then um, used to make proteins. So let's talk about transcription. Transcription is a highly regulated process and uh, it is 
regulated by control sequences in the DNA. So here is a model piece of DNA showing you all these sequences. Here's the start of transcription at the plus one with the red arrow. And there's the, the yellow here uh, is a, what's called an initiator sequence. It is a specific sequence recognized by the polymerase that specifies where to start. All right, and then a little upstream from that, and green is called the TADA sequence. Um, this binds a transcription protein called TF2D. And together, the initiator and the TADA form the core promoter. That's 20 to 35 base pairs in length. You could take just that and it would initiate a transcription, but it wouldn't be very regulated. Then upstream from that, you have what are called local regulatory sequences of different colors, and we'll see examples of this. There are all, there are all sorts of transcriptional regulatory proteins in the cell, and they would bind these sequences specifically, and they would regulate transcription because you don't need to make the full amount of mRNA all the time in every cell. It needs to be regulated. And so these sequences do that. So those are local regulatory sequences, and those constitute the promoter. The regulatory sequence is the Tata box, the initiator. That's the promoter. But then upstream, there are even more sequences that can regulate uh, translation. They can be many thousands of base pairs away. They're called enhancers if they enhance transcription or silencers if they shut it down. Uh, and they are position and orientation dependent. They can be uh, on either strand and, and they're quite far away. So this is all the transcriptional control region. And viral genomes have these sequences in them. Here on the right, here we have an example of an adenovirus promoter. And many of these DNA viruses have multiple promoters in their DNA. So there's one for adenovirus at the top. You see it's got the start site with that yellow sequence that specifies initiation, the, the Tata box. And then upstream, there are binding sites for various proteins, USF, CPF, et cetera, that regulate transcription. And below them are, are two other promoters. There's an SV40 early promoter you can see has multiple start sites, and it has a, a Tata binding box in green, but also multiple sites for binding of this protein called SPL. And then at the bottom is a different adenovirus promoter with different arrangements. And these are all set up so that the transcription can be regulated. You can regulate the production of these individual proteins like SPL, and you get transcriptional regulation. That's the principle. And so what happens in this process is you have a, a DNA with a promoter region, it's shown in orange there, and that nucleates the assembly of RNA polymerase II, which is this gray blob here, and all these other proteins, these initiation proteins, including uh, TF2D, the big one there, which binds the Tata box, but all these others assemble at the promoter by interacting with sequences at the promoter or RNA polymerase II, and that forms the second line here, a closed initiation complex. It doesn't do anything yet. It sits there until ATP is hydrolyzed and then it opens up, the DNA is opened up, and it begins to transcribe uh, the, the DNA. It makes short transcripts initially, uh, which are called abortive transcripts. It goes 20, 30 bases and stops, <laughs> and it goes 20, 30 bases and stops, and then at some point it gets going. And it's not clear why it does that. I, I think it has to do with not having a primer to anchor it and really get it started. But this is typical of enzymes that don't have primers. They, they make these abortive transcripts. And then eventually you start transcribing and the polymerase goes down the DNA. Here's a model on the right of what's happening. There's the active site inside. It's very much like the active site of RNA polymerases that we talked about. It's got two metals in it. It's got a catalytic site. There's a channel here with NTPs come in. The uh, double-stranded uh, DNA comes in one end. It's, it's denatured slightly so that it can be transcribed. And then the RNA comes out of an exit channel. Very straightforward. Uh, well, not, it's not straightforward, but that's, that's a model of what's happening. And so when you have distal regulatory sequences like enhancers, this is how they work. Here's the RNA polymerase bound to the promoter region. There's the start site in red with all those proteins bound to it. And um, here's an enhancer in orange. It's quite far away. It can be thousands of base pairs away. And the enhancer binds uh, some proteins 
that also bind the initiation complex and help stabilize it and enhance uh, transcription. So that's basically how this works at a distance. The DNA is looping around. Now, there are other proteins that regulate transcription. Uh, there are the binding proteins that I've talked briefly about by showing you binding sites on the DNA. We call those uh, sequence-specific DNA binding proteins. They can be of host, host origin. Some viruses encode them as well. Then there's another class called viral coactivating molecules. These don't bind DNA, but they do modulate transcription. And a major way they do so is by modulating the structure of chromatin. As you know, chromatin is DNA wrapped around histones. I showed you a picture. There it is right there. It's a picture of it right there. And that's the, the substrate for transcription, chromatin, not naked DNA. And whether chromatin is tight, whether the DNA is tightly wound around the nucleosome or if it's loose, regulates transcription. So if it's tight, it's hard to transcribe. If it's loose, it's more easy to transcribe. And the tightness of the DNA wrapped around the histone is modulated by chemical modifications like addition of a methyl group or addition of acetyl groups. So these coactivators can modulate, one of the ways they work is by modulating histone structure by uh, methylation or acetylation. So two kinds of transcriptional regulatory proteins, DNA binding proteins and coactivators that regulate histone. They don't bind DNA. And the, the sequence specific DNA binding proteins tend to look like this. They have a three modular uh, component to them. At the, at the end terminus, there's a sequence that allows them to bind DNA. And this, is this typically has specific kinds of protein motifs that are called uh, zinc fingers or helix turn helix or basic motifs. Those are all involved in DNA binding. Then there's a, another sequence that needed to make a dimer. These proteins work as dimers. It's the orange part there. That's typically a leucine zipper, which mediates dimer formation. There's a NLS, which is a nuclear localization signal, right? That is something to get these proteins in the nucleus because that's where they're working, they're made in the cytosol. And then finally, an activation domain which stimulates transcription. Acidic, glutamine-rich, proline-rich, isoleucine-rich, these are all motifs that are found in the activation domain. So they have a modular organization and you can swap these modules around and get different activities if you'd like. So the first question for today is, what is the first biosynthetic event that occurs in cells infected with double-stranded DNA virus. Double-stranded DNA viruses. Pay attention to that, okay? Membrane fusion, transcription, DNA replication, protein synthesis, all of the above. First biosynthetic event. Transcription, that's right. Most of you got that. Memory fusion is not a biosynthetic event. You're not making anything, right? You're just fusing what's already there. Uh, DNA replication, remember, <laughs> you gotta make at least one protein before you can replicate DNA. So you need to make mRNA first. So it's gotta be, trans it has to be transcription. Protein synthesis, you have to make mRNA before you make protein. Now here are some strategies of transcription from very simple to very complicated. So on the left is the origin of the transcriptional components, right? What you need to make mRNA. And so for some viruses, everything comes from the host. There's nothing that's virus specified for transcription. Right? For DNA synthesis, it's another story. But for transcription, these viruses, retroviruses with simple genomes, what does that mean? <laughs> They'd encode fewer proteins than HIV is a retrovirus with a complicated genome, encodes a lot of proteins. So we'll talk about some of those. Colimoviruses are basically retroviruses of plants. Coli sound like cauliflower? Yeah, cauliflower mosaic virus. Yep, it's a retrovirus of plants, or we call them para-retroviruses. And circoviruses, these small single-stranded DNA viruses that infect all of us. <clears throat> the transcription, everything comes from the host. Then we have some viruses where it's host, except there's one viral protein. And bacteriophages, here is what I wanted to show you. Uh, there is one viral protein that uh, is involved in getting transcription of the late genes. We'll talk about early and late genes in a minute. 
then for hepadnas, parvos, papillomas, polyomas, retroviruses with complex genome, there is a single viral protein that regulates transcription, but everything else comes from the host. Right? Polymerase and accessory proteins, but there's one protein that regulates transcription. Then there are some viruses where we have more than one viral protein involved in regulating transcription, adenovirus and herpes viruses. We're gonna see examples of those today. We're gonna to also see an example of a, a uh, polyoma virus where one protein regulates transcription. And then there's the extreme, everything is viral. What's that Lego thing? Everything is what? Awesome. awesome, thank you. Everything is awesome. Well, here, everything is viral. It's the same thing because the viruses are awesome, right? Viral, Mimi viruses and pox viruses, all the proteins involved in RNA synthesis, transcription are viral because that happens in the cytoplasm. It's kind of a logical thing there, right? Now, I, got, I have this note at the bottom to remind me to tell you this. If, the, if everything comes from the host, like for retroviruses with simple genomes, et cetera, those promoters have to be recognized by the host cell machinery. And they are, right? otherwise it wouldn't work. But for some of these viruses, down more complicated on the list, the, the promoters are not recognized very well by the host machinery. So the viruses have to make a protein that deals with that. And we're gonna see that today. All right, now when we talk about regulation, we have two broad regulatory scenarios that I wanna tell you about. Cascade regulation and positive or negative autoregulatory loops. Okay, so here on the top, we have a double-stranded DNA. There's one promoter on the left, and it's, it's colored yellow and purple. And when that gets into a cell, it's transcribed to make mRNA, you make protein X. And then protein X stimulates or is even required for the transcription of another viral promoter for gene Y. So that's called cascade because the X is needed for transcription of Y. We're gonna see some examples of that today. All right, cascade regulation. The other is autoregulatory loops. Here's a positive one where a promoter for gene X makes mRNAs, which are then translated to protein X that stimulates the transcription of the promoter for gene X. So you get more, pro you get more mRNAs made. So that's a positive autoregulatory loop. Can also be negative where the protein will turn off the promoter. Maybe you don't need very much, and so at a certain level of the protein, it turns it off. So either way, and again, we're gonna see examples of that today. So let's start with the simple virus, SV40, which is a polyomavirus, double-stranded circular DNA. It has an ORI, which is an origin of replication. That's for DNA synthesis. We'll see what that does uh, next time. But there are essentially two promoters in this DNA. There's an early and a late promoter going in opposite directions from basically the origin. The promoters are at the origin or very close to the origin. And early and late as implies means with respect to an infected cell. So when the virus first goes in, that's early times. And then late is always defined by the onset of DNA synthesis. So it's not a time, it's not two hours or four hours or anything like that. It's when DNA synthesis begins. That's the late phase of infection. So on this, we have a timeline here on the top where we're showing early and late transcription. So when the virus DNA first comes in, the early promoter is on. You make early messenger RNAs going in here, the left-hand direction. And the key protein made from the early mRNAs is a protein there in blue called LT, large T, uh, or just T antigen with a capital T. And this is a very important protein, probably the most studied protein in the world. So many people have worked on it. Every amino acid has been studied. We'll have a look at that later. But in our situation today, what large T does is to stimulate DNA synthesis. And if when you get enough large T made, you turn on the late promoter because that is what turns on the late promoter, the, the stimulation of DNA synthesis. I'll, I'll show you how that works in a moment. So large T made first, large T is the one protein uh, 
you need to turn on DNA synthesis for SV40. We'll see the mechanism <clears throat> next time. And once DNA synthesis begins, that turns on the late promoter and the late promoter codes for structural proteins because we can build virus particles. Now we've got DNA synthesis going, so now we can build virus particles. So that's a really nice, simple scheme where you have an early protein first, and why are there two phases, you may ask? Well, this doesn't make sense to make capsid proteins until you have DNA to put in a capsid, right? So you first make the protein you need to make DNA, and then you turn on capsid protein synthesis. So here is how the late promoter is turned on by DNA synthesis. Remember, there's an early promoter and a late promoter. There's a protein in the cell called IBP, initiator binding protein. It's a cell protein and it's there in a fixed amount. That protein binds the late promoter and shuts it off. So when the genome comes in, it's immediately bound by IBP. The late promoter is turned off. The early promoter is not affected by IBP. So here the early phase, that's the early promoter. Um, it is not affected by IBP, so it's active and it makes T antigen. T antigen stimulates DNA synthesis. And so now here on the bottom, we're starting to make more genomes. And as you make more and more DNAs, you titrate out the IBP because no more IBP is made. There's a fixed amount in cells. So eventually you have enough DNA so that there's no longer enough IBP to bind the late promoter and that turns on the late promoter. It's basically you're titrating out IBP, which is a repressor. And now you can see down here where you have a lot of DNA, the late promoter is active and you can make late mRNA. So relatively simple mechanism where uh, the DNA synthesis is turning on the late promoter by titrating out that repressor. So here on the left is a graph that shows you concentrations of d d viral genomes. So early phase of infection here, viral DNA concentration is low. We're making T antigen and now we can, at a certain point, we can start to make DNA and, and uh, viral de genomes reproduce. You can see they increase in number. And as the DNA synthesis begins, the late RNAs in green increase. So this is time after infection here. And key point, the initiator binding protein remains constant. So it's titrated out eventually by the increase in the number of viral DNA. So this is how DNA synthesis turns on the late promoter. It's gonna be similar for the other viruses we talk about, although the mechanism is not as well developed as it is here for SV40. So now let's take a look at this in the context of a single cell infection. We have the virus coming in, the DNA is delivered to the nucleus, the early promoter is active, it makes the early message which goes out in the cytoplasm, large T protein is made, large T protein goes back in the nucleus, where it needs to work. It will stimulate DNA synthesis here. Now we see we have two molecules of DNA. And once you get enough DNA made, you get the late mRNAs made, they go out into the cytosol, make capsid proteins, which then go back in the nucleus and encapsidate that viral DNA. So the function of the early and late phases is to delay the synthesis of structural proteins until the DNA has been replicated uh, because if you didn't have DNA around, you'd be making empty capsids and they would not be infectious. So that's a simple example. Now the uh, intermediate complexity is adenovirus where we just have an, an additional phase. We have an immediate early, an early and a late. And this is, this is really interesting. And this is gonna take us for a couple of stories in this course now. So uh, this is the first time we're seeing it. So the genome, is shown, the timeline is shown at the top. That's not the genome, it's a timeline of infection. We have three viral proteins and DNA synthesis are gonna go govern the transitions. So first, the DNA comes in, the first promoter that's active is the immediate early promoter, i.e., and the protein that's made is called E1A. E1A protein, little purple eggplant type thing there. E1A is needed for the transcription of the early genes. So this is different from SV40, where the early promoter worked in the cell, but for adenovirus, the early promoter doesn't work. We're gonna see why in a moment. You need another protein to get that early promoter to work, E1A. So the early region encodes E2, which is needed for DNA synthesis. It also encodes 
the DNA polymerase and accessory proteins needed for DNA synthesis. So now DNA synthesis begins and that activates the late promoter, just like with SV40, but a different mechanism. So E2 proteins turn on DNA synthesis, which activates the late promoter. And then in addition, another protein called 4A2 further activates late gene transcription. So that's also different from SV40, a little more complicated. But here's the key here, which is really important. And this is gonna come back when we talk about virus, viruses causing cancers, all right? Um, so E1A is needed because there's a cellular transcription protein called E2F that's needed for the early promoter of adenovirus to be active. So let me show you that mechanism right now. So uh, E2F is a cellular transcription protein that is normally inactive. It's complex with a cell protein called RB. RB is a, stands for retinoblastoma. It is an oncoprotein, and we're gonna talk about that when we talk about cancers. But in the cell, uh, E2F, which is the protein that's needed for the early region promoter of adenovirus, is bound to RB, and it's inactive. The promoters are shut off. So in this state, the E, the early promoter of ad is shut off. And the reason is that this complex of proteins, uh, RB, well, actually it's RB itself, which is bound to E2F, recruits histone deacetylases to the promoter. So that for, to understand what's going on there, you have to remember that closed chromatin, tightly, DNA tightly wound around nucleosomes is transcriptionally inactive. And acetylation will loosen up the chromatin. So there on the right, we have acetyl groups chemically added to the chromatin, it relaxes it, and it turns on transcription, all right? So acetylation is one of those signals. RB recruits, recruits histone deacetylases to the promoter area. They take off the acetyl group, the chromatin tightens up, you shut off transcription. So the presence of RB is turning off transcription. So the function of E1A is actually to bind RB pull it off of E2F, and now the histone deacetylases aren't recruited to the promoter anymore, the promoter can be active. So E1A is needed to free up E2 so that it can bind to the viral E2 promoter, the early, re sorry, the viral early promoter, the E promoter, and get transcription going, which includes the polymerases and all the proteins you need for DNA synthesis, okay? So this, this is a key point to remember for later on when we talk about uh, cancers and cell division. That's why we need E1A. Now the genome of adenovirus, double-stranded DNA, about 36,000 base pairs in length, has transcription on both strands. There are promoters on both strands. It's a very complicated uh, organization here. At the left end, you see the early, the E1A genes are encoded. So the, the E1 promoter, E1A promoter, the, the, the immediate early promoter is there on the left. Uh, and then those E1A frees up E2F so that you can make early region transcripts. And those are on the other strand here. You can see early 2 and 2E and E4. These are all early region. These can code proteins you need for DNA synthesis, like the DNA polymerase is encoded in the genome, uh, the DNA binding protein and so forth. That gets DNA replication going and then the late promoter is activated and the, promo the late promoter is up here on the top and it encodes all these structural proteins to build those complicated virus particles, all right? So E1A, E, and L, those, that's the sequence of events and I've explained to you, E1A is needed to turn on E because it frees up E2F and the E proteins start DNA synthesis which derepresses the late promoter. And in the context of an infected cell, here's what we see. Now we have immediate early, early and late phases. The viral DNA comes into the nucleus. The, the immediate early promoter's active. Okay, that works on its own. You can make the E1A message. The E1A protein is made in the cytoplasm, goes back in the nucleus, binds RB, turns on the early promoter. So now we have early transcripts being made as a consequence of uh, production of E1A. And those lead to the trans transcription and translation of proteins 
for the DNA polymerase, DNA binding protein, the primer for DNA synthesis. They all go in the nucleus, start to replicate the genome. That activates the late promoter, which encodes structural proteins. And those go all back in the nucleus. You build a capsid, you put the DNA in the capsid, and out it comes from the cell. So a beautifully choreographed series of events. I guess you could call it an unfortunate series of events. Wasn't that another movie, right? Mm -hmm. Something like that. A series of unfortunate events. For the cell, this is unfortunate, but not for the virus, of course. And then herpes virus, transcriptional program, three phases like adeno, but with a twist. For these viruses, in the virus particle is a protein called VP16. It's in the particle, you see between the capsid and the membrane, there's, there's a lot of proteins in there, and one of them is VP16. Um, and this is needed so that the immediate early promoter gets recognized by the cell. So like adenovirus, remember the immediate early promoter was recognized, no problem, but it's not recognized very well by the cell. So the virus has to bring in a protein that will bind to the promoter and let the cell transcriptional machinery transcribe it. Just another way for getting that immediate early uh, gene made. Now, the immediate early <clears throat> transcripts do not function like E1A does in adenovirus. They have nothing to do with RB. Uh, these simply turn on the transcription of the early promoter and, and uh, they make proteins that, uh, well, the early region encodes replication proteins and that starts DNA synthesis going and then the late uh, promoter is activated as a consequence. So we, the immediate early uh, transcripts include proteins like uh, ICP0, which activates E, turns on DNA synthesis and activates L. And of course the L region encodes uh, the structural protein. So a very similar series of events here, delaying the synthesis of structural proteins until you have DNA mate. But the key here is this VP16, which is uh, very different. VP16, is needed to get the cell machinery to recognize the immediate early promoter. And so here is that uh, series of events in an infected cell. Just like adenovirus, we have immediate early, early, and late, but sl a slight twist with VP16. And this slide shows you uh, where the VP16 is coming from. So the virus binds to the cell and uncoats right at the plasma membrane. And the nucleocapsid comes out and will dock on the nucleus and eventually the, the viral DNA will go into the nucleus. But you can see VP16 is also coming out of the, of the uncoding uh, virion up there and that will go in the nucleus and it will activate that immediate early promoter. So you get immediate early transcripts made. The protein is made, goes back in the nucleus to activate the early promoter. Early message are made which include all the things you need to make DNA, and so then the DNA is, is, is replicated, and then you have late gene, uh, late promoter activation, encoding the structural proteins that build the new virus particle. So in all cases, we delay the uh, synthesis of structural proteins until we have DNA. And here you can see that uh, this DNA, as it comes in the nucleus, gets wrapped around chromatin. As I said before, any DNA that comes in the nucleus is chromatinized in an attempt to silence it. So you may ask, well, how does the herpes genome get transcribed if it's silenced? Well, the genome must encode uh, proteins that antagonize that, that silencing. And in fact, that's what they do. Adenovirus E1A protein, stimulating the expression of adenovirus E2 protein, which then stimulates the expression of 4A2 and L4 is an example of a negative autoregulatory loop repression of gene expression, cascade regulation, dimerization. All right, you got cascade regulation, that's correct. So we have one thing turning on another, turning on another, that's, that's a cascade. It's not negative autoregulatory, there's, it's all positive uh, interactions. It's not repression. Okay, now the, back to the mRNA, and I want to show you the cap structure, which we talked about last time in terms of influenza stealing caps from host messages to prime their RNA synthesis. So all messenger RNAs that are made are capped at the five prime end. And this is an unusual linkage, that's all it is. It's a, it's a base, it can be a G, or typically is a G 
but it's linked in a five to five prime linkage instead of a five to three prime linkage, which happens everywhere else. So right between the subsequent bases here, you see a three prime to five prime linkage but here it's five prime to five prime and all three phosphates are left in there as well. So that's called a cap. It's often methylated here uh, and at two other places. And this is needed for various properties of the message, including translatability of the protein, stability uh, and so forth. And the methyl is part of it. So that's what a cap is. It is added very early uh, during transcription. In fact, the way it works is uh, the, here's the RNA polymerase that's bound to a promoter region and is starting to uh, transcribe the message. You can see the green uh, message coming out there. Nothing happens until about 20 to 30 bases are made. And then the cap is added, probably because there are a lot of abortive short transcripts. So the process is held until we get to a certain point. Uh, and then what happens is a phosphorylation event of the C-terminal domain of the polymerase, which then allows the capping enzyme to come in and bind. And the capping enzyme adds the five prime cap to the message as the polymerase is moving down the DNA, synthesizing uh, mRNA. So that's, the, we say it's co-transcriptional capping because it's not made at the very beginning, it's not made at the end, it's made during a transcription. And so the other modification besides capping, of course, is polyadenylation, the, the exported messages all have poly A sequences at their three prime end, which are uh, added uh, in the nucleus. And the way this happens is shown on the right. It's a complicated series of events that you don't need to actually know in detail, but I want you to just understand it is different from how RNA viruses put poly A on their messenger RNAs. So the, on the top is the pre-mRNA as it's made in the nucleus. The, um, the polymerase goes all the way to the end, to a termination site. It actually passes the polyadenylation signal, which is AAUAAA. And then the pre-mRNA needs to be cleaved at that signal by a series of uh, enzyme. And then poly A is added where that cleavage has occurred. So the AAUAAA specifies cleavage, so the, the rest of the message three prime there, it gets thrown away. Uh, and then you have a poly A polymerase that adds uh, a few hundred A's, 200 A's or so to the three prime. And then you end up with a three prime polyadenylated messenger RNA. So it's very different from RNA viruses because here it's, it's added uh, post-transcriptionally. And so this is a table that contrasts the different ways of adding uh, poly A to viral mRNAs. So we have what I just showed you, which is post-transcription, or cleavage of the precursor mRNA, and then the poly A is added. So cleavage at that AAUAAA. That's done by cellular poly A enzymes and all these DNA viruses that we're talking about today. That's how their uh, mRNAs are polyadenylated. And yesterday, or Monday, we talked about polyadenylation occurring during mRNA synthesis, right? So for influenza virus, and VSV, remember the polymerase encounters a stretch of U's and begins to stutter and pump out A's because the polymerase can't move anymore. And eventually it makes a poly A stretch. So we'll call that reiterative copying of U in the template. And then there's the strategy of poliovirus and flaviviruses where the minus strand has a lot of U's in it. And those are simply copied to make A's. So copying of U stretches in the template RNA. Now, of course, the virus delivers a plus strand with A's in it, which is copied to make a, a negative strand that has U's in it, and that's copied again to make uh, the poly A. It's poliovirus and alpha viruses, not flaviviruses. Not all flaviviruses are uh, polyadenylated. Now, the other event that's important for us to explore because it's, it, it, it's um, uh, essential for viral diversity is splicing, mRNA splicing. And this was discovered first in adenovirus infected cells. And the, the, what was found was that the precursor, the pre-mRNAs made in the nucleus were bigger than the final mRNAs that ended up in the cytoplasm. And people were trying to figure out why this was. And so this was the key experiment uh, that was done by two different groups, uh, Phil Sharp and, and Rich Roberts, 
in two different places, and it involves hybridization. So what they did is take the adenovirus mRNA encoding a late structural gene. There's a hexon gene, which is one of the structural proteins. And they also uh, purified um, viral DNA, made it single-stranded. And they hybridized the two, which means they just mixed them and let them anneal to each other. And then they looked at it under an electron microscope and they saw this structure here. And I've just redrawn it here to simplify it. So we have the mRNA in green, and then the DNA is hybridized to it, but there are long pieces, three long pieces of DNA, which are removed from the final mRNA. And they called this removal splicing, uh, and this was the first discovery of it, and they received the Nobel Prize for that because it hadn't been known before, and now it turns out it occurs in all cells and in all virus-infected cells. Even RNA virus-infected cells do some splicing uh, of RNAs. And so on the bottom, is the structure of the DNA where the, the actual hexon mRNA body that encodes the protein is shown in green. And then there are three regions, A, B, and C, that are removed from the final mRNA. Uh, and then three short sequences here that are joined uh, to the very five prime end of the RNA. So that is splicing. And it's a really interesting process uh, that occurs by this mechanism. But over the years, people have studied this with many uh, pre-mRNAs. And at the top, uh, you see the structure of that. So the parts that are removed are called introns, and the parts of the message that remain are called the exons. They're shown in green. And we're looking here at a sequence of, uh, of introns and exons for a whole bunch of mRNAs. And there's a highly conserved A right here. Uh, in the middle. And it turns out that that's essential for the splicing reaction. So what happens is in the nucleus, uh, that A carries out a nucleophilic attack on the phosphate here, and it cuts the bond and makes this lariat, it's called, right? It's, it looks like one of those uh, ropes that you would toss with a loop at one end and a long handle. So now there's a three free prime hydroxyl right next to exon one, and that attacks the second uh, phosphodiester bond, and it joins the exons together. So now we have removed the intron in the form of this lariat. And you can actually find these in cells. And now we have our exons joined together. So that's how splicing works. This is a process that's probably really old because you don't actually need protein to do it. The whole process takes place on what's called a spliceosome, which is an RNA enzyme, a ribozyme. Uh, and this is just a series of events that happen, a series of proteins assemble on the pre-mRNA. So there's the pre-mRNA with the intron and the exon. So a series of proteins and RNAs, these, these U's are protein RNA complexes, and they assemble and carry out the reaction that I just told you, giving you the spliced mRNA and the uh, lariat intron. And you, you actually don't need the protein components to do this. The RNAs are sufficient to do it. So the uh, we call this a, a ribozyme or an RNA-based enzyme. And so this is probably an ancient activity. Maybe it existed even in the uh, RNA world. So the point of all of this is to tell you that this splicing gives you a huge variety in the kinds of mRNAs that you can make. You can make a lot of different proteins from a single message. And so, for example, you can have constitutive splicing. Well, here we have on the left a pre-mRNA with two introns. And you can simply remove both of those by splicing, and that's called constitutive because there's no regulation. But the same pre-mRNA can undergo alternative splicing, where sometimes you splice uh, one to three, for example, by a splice going from the end of one to the beginning of three. So that's called alternative splicing rather than splicing in order. There could be alternative five prime splice sites in an mRNA, there can be alternative three prime acceptor sites. So it gives you a whole variety of mRNAs. So basically you can make a lot of different proteins from a single gene. That's the beauty of this. And I'll give you an example of how this works for adenovirus with uh, the late, the major late transcript. So here on the bottom strand, the major late pre-mRNA is huge. It's almost the whole length of the 30 
4,000 base pair genome. It's big, it has a number of introns in, in pink, and it has five different polyadenylation sites. So here we're gonna combine alternative splicing with polyadenylation site selection to make a whole lot of messages and therefore proteins uh, from one mRNA. So this precursor gets polyadenylated at one of five different poly A sites, one, two, three, four, five different messages result. And then you undergo alternative splicing in various ways. Here, for example, you have two possible three prime splice sites on the left, you have four possible three prime splice sites here, and you get all these different messenger RNAs, uh, late messenger RNAs, encoding structural proteins from that single transcript. So the splicing and polyadenylation site selection gives you a really uh, wide ability to make a lot of proteins from one uh, mRNA, from one gene actually. So you can imagine that in a virus with a small genome, that's useful because I, SV40 has a small genome. It can make a lot of different proteins by splicing and polyadenylating in different ways. All right, so our last question for today is which statement about polyadenylation of DNA virus mRNAs is correct? It always occurs in the cytoplasm. It occurs after cleavage of pre-mRNA. Poly A is added at the five prime end of pre-mRNA. It is specified by a stretch of U residues in the template. Wow, look at that. <laughs> so the right answer, to, so polyadenylation of DNA virus mRNAs occurs after cleavage of the pre-mRNA, right? I'll show you that on the slide. Doesn't occur in the cytoplasm. That's on another slide, I'll show you that. Poly A is not added to the five prime end. It's at the three prime end of the mRNA. And D, which most people picked, it's specified by a stretch of U. That's for RNA viruses, right? So this yesterday or Monday, we talked about mm -hmm. how influenza and VSV, the U is special or polio is specified by a stretch of U in the template. But for DNA viruses, it's not. There's no stretch of U. It's a polydenylation signal which specifies the cleavage. We have to go back and look to uh, tell you why all this is correct. Let's see. Uh, well, cytoplasm here. So there is uh, on the left transcription and poly A addition in, this, in, the, in the nucleus of the cell, not the cytoplasm, okay? So but the, the poly A is added before it gets out into the uh, cytoplasm. And you can see on the right here, we have cleavage at the AAU, AAA. There's no stretch of U's in the um, template. And then the poly A is added to the three prime end of the message, not the five prime end. Five prime end would be up on the other side. So there's no stretch of U's. That is summarized on this slide, right? Post uh, DNA viruses, it's cleavage of pre-mRNA pre -mRNA followed by polydenylation. And then for the RNA viruses, copying of U at, on the template or either reiteratively or by a, a copying of a U, long U stretch. So that's the distinction between DNA and RNA virus polydenylation, okay? The last topic I want to cover is export of mRNAs from the nucleus. I, I mentioned this earlier, so uh, let me, let me uh, give you some detail. Splicing, the process of splicing marks an mRNA for export. So what do I mean by that? So the things that are in the nucleus, to get out, they have to be brought out by a nuclear export machinery or a nuclear export pathway, where we, we have in the nuclear membrane a series of pores, and there's a whole machinery that will carry things through the pores. They don't just diffuse through. And all these proteins on this slide with funny names like <coughs> um, NXT1 and UAP56 and so forth, these are part of the nuclear export machinery. So what do I mean that splicing marks the mRNA? So here's a pre-mRNA at the top with an intron and two exons. Now remember I showed you that a, a series of RNA protein complexes assemble on this pre-mRNA to splice it. Let's go back and show you that just so we, we make that clear. This, all these U1s and U2s, et cetera, uh, 
um, these are protein RNA complexes that catalyze the splicing. They remain on the spliced mRNA. See, there, there are proteins like CBC and T-Rex and SR, CPSF6. They stay on the mRNA and the export machinery recognizes those and says, this is something that needs to go out of the nucleus. So that's what I mean by splicing marks and mRNA for export, because those splicing proteins remain, some of them remain, and they tell the export machinery to take this RNA out of the nucleus. So in other words, if you're not spliced, you're not getting out of the nucleus. The problem is many viral genomes need to get out unspliced. Here's an example. All right, so again, we have cellular pre-mRNAs, which are spliced in order to be exported, but Retroviral RNAs have splice sites because they need to be spliced to, to be able to make certain proteins. But the whole RNA has to get out too because that's the genome. So here is the retroviral RNA capped and polyadenylated. It has an intron in it that is removed in some cases to get certain proteins made, but the whole thing has to go out. It has to go out unspliced. So what do you do if you're not getting spliced? You're not gonna be marked for export, right? Well, what has happened is these, these genomes, there are two strategies I'm gonna show you. Uh, one here, there is a sequence near the three prime end of the viral RNA called CTE, constitutive transport element. Guess what CTE does? It binds components of the export pathway, NFX1, NXT1. These are the proteins needed to get an mRNA out of the nucleus. So they would normally be binding the splicing factors as you see on the right here. So NFX1 is binding SR, which is a splicing factor. But there's no splicing going on for the retrovirus, so instead NFX1 binds CTE. So this sequence has evolved to bind components of the export machinery. So that mRNA, that retroviral mRNA does not have to be spliced in order to be uh, exported from the nucleus. So it's very cool. HIV has a different strategy, uh, which involves a viral protein. So here we have the HIV uh, DNA at the top. It's being transcribed into a long message RNA, which is basically the genome of the virus. The genome needs to get out unspliced so it can be put into new virus particles. But the problem is it's full of splice sites. And how do you get exported? Uh, the, full, the full length without being spliced. So what happens is this genome is spliced down to a small mRNA that goes out into the cytosol and encodes a protein called REV, and REV goes back in the nucleus and binds to a structure at the three prime end of the viral RNA called the REV responsive element, RRE. And that binding will then allow the mRNA to be exported by the export machinery of the nucleus because REV is recognized by export proteins and they say, okay, this RNA is marked properly and we're gonna get it out. So that gets the full length genome uh, out into the cytoplasm. So it's a different strategy where it's a protein binding to this element and then the nuclear export machinery binds the protein. So that's what you have to do in order to get out of the nucleus unspliced. So splicing, as you can see, I like to say gives you value added you can create different mRNAs and different proteins by this alternative ways of splicing, as I mentioned, in, in different poly A selection sites. So you have a small DNA genome, you can make a lot of proteins. Instead of just having one or two open reading frames, you can splice to make a lot of different proteins. The other advantage here is that you can regulate gene expression by regulating splicing. Many viruses encode proteins that regulate the splicing process and give them exactly what they need uh, at the right time. Yeah. Is um, REV expressed early or late? Is REV expressed early or late? Uh, it, it, I would say it's expressed early because as soon as this RNA gets in, it is spliced down to the REV uh, mRNA. And then as its levels accumulate, then you can start to get full length genomes exported. You're probably thinking you don't want to export full length until you have the structural proteins made and you could use that, right? 
Or maybe you're not thinking that. <laughs> you just want to know the answer. <laughs> okay. I think it's made early, frankly. And when levels get high enough, then you can export full-length genomes. All right, so I want to close by talking about um, other kinds of RNAs and what happens to them. And the first is RNA editing. This is a kind of non-templated uh, RNA activity that I mentioned uh, before, where you can change bases and make a difference. And so the example here is using hepatitis delta virus, which is a single-stranded uh, DNA with a circular genome. And it produces an mRNA that encodes delta antigen where there's an initiation codon and a termination codon there, gives you a, what's called small delta. There's an enzyme in cells called an RNA deaminase, uh, which can change the A to an inosine. Uh, and that will then, when it gets replicated, encode a tryptophan. So you're changing basically the stop codon to a codon, and now you get a larger delta, delta antigen. There's a, another stop codon downstream, which is used to terminate the large delta antigen. So changing one base gives you a different protein. This is called RNA editing. It happens in a number of viruses and also some eukaryotic organisms as well. There are also many, many non-coding RNAs found in the cell. We've been talking mostly about messenger RNAs, but um, you know there are tRNAs and ribosomal RNAs, which are non-coding RNAs, but there are lots of others that have recently been discovered because we start to sequence all the RNA. You know, when I was a graduate student, we used to run RNA gels and there was always garbage at the bottom, small RNA. We, we said, it was garbage. It's just broken down mRNAs or something threw it away, but it's all these short <laughs> RNAs that have really important functions. Um, and so they're classified into short and long non-coding RNAs. There's microRNAs, which are quite short here, long non-coding RNAs, short non-coding RNAs, and also circular RNAs. And um, they have a variety of functions, and these are cellular and viral uh, RNAs. And again, they're non-coding. They don't code for any protein, but they have huge regulatory activities that are just beginning to get studied. So you're probably all familiar with microRNAs. These have a regulatory role. They're, they're produced beginning in the nucleus by the transcription by Paul II of a long uh, mRNA that's then cut up by enzymes, exported and linked to a, a, a silencing complex, which will then target an mRNA that matches with the sequence of that microRNA. And so the, the targeting can translationally suppress. This should be translational suppression, not transitional. Um, you can suppress translation by the binding of these microRNAs, or you can actually degrade uh, the RNA. So cells make these to regulate their own gene expression. They sometimes do it to regulate viruses, and viruses make them uh, as well. So we're going to talk about some examples of this, and here's one of them. So these, these microRNAs are called MIRs. MIR, microRNA, and there is one that is a liver-specific MIR, MIR-122. It's only in the liver. And it is absolutely needed for the reproduction in liver cells of hepatitis C virus. So hepatitis C virus is an RNA virus that causes hepatitis. We will talk about it more later. Uh, there is the viral genome. It's a plus-stranded RNA virus with an envelope. It's a, it's a Flavy virus. And the five prime non-coding region of hep C is highly structured with stem loops. And at the very five prime end, there are two binding sites for MIR-122. There's one there and there's one there. And without that binding, the virus will not reproduce. The RNA does not reproduce. So in any, any non-liver cell, the virus doesn't replicate. Only in the liver. It explains why the virus is hepatotropic. It reproduces in the liver. And if you put these mirrors into some other cell in culture, you can get the virus to replicate in them. So really interesting evolution of reproducing in a certain place. This is not what MIR-122 was meant for. MIR-122 regulates cholesterol in the cell, but the virus has evolved to take advantage of it to stabilize its genome. And so um, it, actually a company has made an antagonist of MIR-122. They're called antagomeres because they bind these mirrors very tightly and the, it's an antiviral for hep C. It's actually been uh, put in clinical trials and, and it works in, in people with uh, hepatitis C. Uh, 
So you figure out the basic molecular biology and then you can design antivirals. There are also circular RNAs that are made in cells. And this is, these are made by a process of back splicing. So you know, when we splice, we go five to three prime and remove the introns. Uh, these, these are uh, the, the, the reverse uh, sequence of events. And when you do that, you get circles of various kinds, depending on what is, is spliced with what. And you can have a combination of introns and exons as well. Uh, these are very abundant in uninfected cells. In fact, many cancer cells have a specific repertoire of circular RNAs that people are trying to figure out what does that mean. Um, but what they seem to be, at least some of the things that we've figured out, are sponges. So they can be sponges or binding sites for microRNAs. So we think if you make microRNAs, you don't need them right away. You could hang them on these circular RNAs until they're needed. And you can also hang uh, RNA binding proteins on these sponges until you need them. So they seem to be highly bound to both microRNAs uh, and RNA binding proteins. And the last thing I want to tell you is that RNA can also be chemically modified and influence its activity. And there's an activity that's very hot these days called, well, it's very hot to study, reversible N6-methylation of adenosine. So here is adenosine with its ribose and the adenine base. And um, this is the N6 up at the top of the ring. And this can be methylated. You can see the methyl has been added into this one, N6-methyl uh, adenosine. And there is a whole series of enzymes involved in this. They're called riders. The ones that put the methyl on are called riders. One, enzymes that remove the methyl are called erasers. And then there are proteins that can tell whether there's a methyl on it or not and have some effect, and they're called readers. So whoever named them was a little bit creative, right? Writers, readers, and erasers. And an example of how these can have an effect is shown at the right. So this is hepatitis C virus where assembly of the particle requires the viral genome to interact with the capsid protein, which is blue, on the surface of a lipid droplet, right? a, a little vesicle in the cell that is lipid rich. And that's how the virus is assembled and, and you produce infectious viruses. If internal adenosines in this genome are methylated, uh, they will block the association of the RNA with the lipid droplets. So methylation is a cellular defense to try to prevent assembly of infectious particles. And so if you deplete the methyl transferases in a cell that put on the methyl, um, or these, these readers, the YTHDF proteins that read the methyl by binding to it, if you deplete those, you enhance reproduction of the virus. And so in a cell that's trying to, you may ask, how does hepatitis C virus ever reproduce? Well, it antagonizes these methylations and readings so that it can get its, its virus particles assembled. So this is just one example of many different ways that uh, reversible methylation of, of uh, adenosines can regulate the activity of RNA. So today we have talked about DNA genomes, double-stranded DNA genomes transcribing uh, to produce mRNA. And we have figured out that these diverse genome structures all have to make their way to uh, double-stranded DNA in order to be transcribed. Next time, we're gonna talk about how these diverse DNA structures are replicated because they're not all the same. So what has to happen? Uh, viral DNA replication. <laughs>